So once again, we're back at Lockheed. Yep, back at Lockheed. And we are with an aircraft with an interesting reputation. Yes. I think you're referring to it being called the Widowmaker. That would be it, yes. <laughs> yes. So before we get to that, let's talk about <laughs> the wing design. So we talked about the F-100 well, well, being- Hang on, what yes. wing? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to see here. So F-100 being a relatively conventional swept wing, F-102 being a delta wing, now we have another radical departure on a supersonic wing design that actually worked reasonably well, actually very well for high speed. Not so much for slow speed, and we'll get to that in a second. So this is a wing with very little sweep, so the, it's hard to see here if you're not looking straight down, but this has like 20 degrees of sweep, you know, less than half of the sweep, uh, leading edge sweep of the other airplanes we're talking about. It turns out you can actually make a really decent wing with very little sweep and make it go supersonic if it's really sharp. And I don't know if you can see how sharp this is. You could almost cut yourself on this wing. Like it's not razor sharp, but it's it's really sharp. Like there is no radius there, right? Like you yeah. could you could split wood with this wing easily. <laughs> um, and it's solid. I don't know what material that is, but it's solid. Like you literally could split logs with this wing. And its overall thickness is really thin as well. Like in the middle of this wing, this wing is probably only like this thick. Um, so what happens here is that the, what we were talking about with wing sweep and, and the angles or the vortex lift and so forth, like you just throw that out the window. And we have a really sharp leading edge. You get a shock wave here, but this leading edge is so sharp, the shock wave doesn't really add much drag. Mm -hmm. So you can actually make a decent high speed wing really simply like this. And, and Kelly Johnson figured that out. Of like, we're not going through all that crazy stuff. We're just going to put a really sharp leading edge on it and it's going to be good. And it was. Um, until you tried to fly slow. <laughs> Which is an important aspect in two phases of flight. Yes, <laughs> two very important phases of flight, yes. So, a couple of things. First of all, very similar time frame. I think this one came a year after those two. It was certainly in development at the same time. This airplane actually goes Mach 2 yeah. on, on essentially the same thrust engine. It is a different engine. This is a J79, whereas those had J57s. But same amount of thrust goes Mach 2. The, that one barely did Mach 1, and same with the F100. So it's just a phenomenal design for its time. And so there's a couple secrets to why this airplane was able to go that fast. This wing is certainly one of them. If you look at the size of this wing, this wing is a tiny wing. So it's not producing much drag once it goes fast. And the whole airplane was kind of like that. Um, the whole airplane is just small to minimize surface area and minimize drag. Uh, the other secret on this is the inlet, but we'll talk about that in a second because right where you're at is a great place to talk about the low speed. So a wing like this with that sharp leading edge is a terrible low speed airplane. So as the air flows over that sharp leading edge, it just wants to stall. It, it doesn't want to do anything good once you start to go slow. So this airplane had a really high landing speed. The other interesting thing this thing had, which is you really can't see these features, but there's a big wing flap here. When this wing flap folded down, there's actually a slot right here that opens up and they took engine bleed air and blew that out of that slot. So it's called what, that's what's called a blown flap. So by energizing that flow, it takes the whole airflow over the wing and makes it want to stay stuck a little bit better and let it fly um, at, a, at a slower speed. So okay. it's a really neat idea and it actually worked really good until your engine quit. <laughs> so if you were on a landing uh, descent approach profile and your engine quit, I think the standard procedure in this airplane was to eject. I think it basically could not land without some engine power to keep that blown flap. Um, the problem with this airplane is the original ones had a downward ejecting ejection seat like many airplanes of this vintage. It was because those early generation ejection seats didn't have the big powerful rockets they have today and there was a lot of worry, especially at higher speeds, that if you eject it up you were going to go straight through that tail. And then at that point it's like, what's the point of ejecting? Yeah. So eject it down. The problem is, is in this airplane, most of the time you needed to eject was when you were coming in to land, which is when you exactly do not want to be ejecting down. Yes. So to put it to put it very mildly. Yes. The Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, is home to one of the largest non-government funded aviation and space museums in the world. Featuring nearly 400 aircraft, the museum is home to an incredible collection like NASA's NB-52 X-15 dropship and 747 SP Sophia Airborne Observatory to a wealth of rare military types from air forces all around the world 
to the first production 777. Whether you are a military or civilian aviation geek, there will be an incredible aircraft around every corner of this epic 80 acre site for you to explore. As the Aviation Show's partnership with the Pima Air and Space Museum enters its third year, we're delighted to say that Pima is truly a top of your bucket list museum to visit. And it keeps getting better, as this year the Tucson Military Vehicle Museum will be opening right next door. To find out more about the incredible collection and the fantastic events coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum, and of course the Tucson Military Vehicle Museum, head over to www.pimaair.org to plan your trip to one of the world's great aviation collections, and one that now includes tanks next door, if that's your sort of thing. I'm intrigued on the inlet on this. Yes. So because basically we are looking at an engine with a pilot strapped to the front and a couple wings on it. That's yeah. essentially what the, the, yeah. the Starfighter is. The intakes of, to me have always seemed relatively small for what they need, but they do have a very interesting conical addition. Yes. They, they started to have a little bit of magic going on that all inlets after this were going to have, at least on, on high speed, high supersonic airplanes. So we talked about the pitot inlet before where the air comes in, there's a normal shock wave in here and the air slows down and, and goes into the engine. Works great at low supersonic speed. Once you get up to like Mach 1.5, 1.6 or higher, that style doesn't work very well because you're gonna lose too much energy going through that shock wave. So this is what's called an axis symmetric, or some people call it a spike inlet. And what happens here is the air as it starts to come in here actually deflects a little bit, but just a little bit, not, not, a, not a big sharp change. And what that does is makes what's called an oblique shock. So we were talking about normal shocks earlier. Normal means it's square. Oblique means it's at an angle. So you get this conical shock wave right here that the air has basically goes through that it also slows down, but it does so with a lot less energy loss. So that's really one of the really big secrets on why this airplane would go Mach 2, is because it could get air to its engine losing, I don't know, probably 10 or 20% of its energy versus if this was those inlets trying to go Mach 2, you're going to lose like half of your energy and have half of your thrust at those speeds. So essentially we're turbocharging the air coming in. Using essentially, the yes, that's a great way to put it. You're, you're, you're turning more of that energy into pressure as opposed to temperature because you can pressure, you get the energy back. Temperature is just wasted. It yeah. just makes everything hot. And this is a very unique design as well because this inlet has no moving parts. It just has this fixed spike and it doesn't work great at Mach 2 or at Mach 1. It's actually designed somewhere in the middle, like Mach 1.4. You're starting to lose a little at those two ends, but they're not far enough away to make much difference. When we get to later designs, you start to see moving parts here that actually change their shape depending on what speed you're going. So you're trying to maximize that energy or reduce that energy loss, maximize the efficiency over a much wider range of speeds. So most famously on Concorde with the veins in there, yep. and Concord then again veins. with the yep. spike on the SRS-72. Yep. Yep. yep, and then you can get even more complicated than that, like the F-111 has very well, complicated yeah. parts that are moving with a, a, a rounded shape like we this. We don't like talking about the F-111. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> right, so that's F-104. That's F-104. Which is a fascinating aircraft. We, it is. We're, we're always hard, hard on it, but it's, it's taking that cutting edge and that leading edge and turning it up to 11. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, the other interesting thing about this airplane, I think it was the first airplane that used the, and I forget the nomenclature, but the uh, 20 millimeter six barrel Gatling oh, gun. Oh, the Vulcan. The Vulcan, Vulcan yes, gun, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's essentially on every airplane since, at least every American mm. airplane since. And so this was the first one to use that, um, which is kind of fascinating. Again, this airplane was so ahead of its time when you compare it to the contemporaries over here. Again, far from perfect. <laughs> and, and actually this airplane, because of that wing, was a terrible dogfighter. It actually got a pretty bad reputation, but what it became was an interceptor yeah. where you're not really dogfighting anymore. You're, you're really, you need something you can scramble and you can get up to altitude and go really fast to go warn off Soviet bombers or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it was great for that. But if you got in a turning fight with another airplane, not so yeah. much. Because you're, you're into a part of the flight envelope where those wings can't really yeah, do they, anything. They're they too, can't too produce, sharp. There's no. Yeah. There's no curv yep. curvature. There's no camber. Camber. There we That's go. right. And That's leading edge radius. Yeah. yeah. Be sure to check out the full-length Century Series video filmed at the Pima Air and Space Museum, and the two follow-up videos on the F-101 Voodoo and F-110 Spectre, better known as the F-4 Phantom II.